They Raised Horses by Anthony H. Coppola, Part 6, Observances and Celebration. Observances, Memorial Day, or Decoration Day. June 6, 1868. Honor to Union Dead. On Saturday last, a respectable number of persons assembled at Evergreen Cemetery to honor the memory of our fallen heroes. Deacon Albert Butler acted as Master of Ceremonies. A prayer was offered by Rev. William T. Briggs, who also read the list of soldiers from this town and the casualties in closing with appropriate remarks. Rev. W. Silverthorne and Deacon Albert Butler followed, after which the company repaired to the different graves and decorated each with flowers. Everything passed off satisfactorily, and it is hoped that these exercises will be repeated each year, and the memory of our Union martyrs and their heroic deeds of valor always kept fresh and green. <clears throat> June 4th, 1886. Memorial Day was very fittingly observed here by demonstrations of more than usual interest. At 11 o'clock, Samuel Sibley Post assembled at the hall, and at 1.30 the procession formed on Main Street in front of Central Hall in the following order. Norwich City Band, G.A.R., Fire King Engine Company, School Children, Clergy and Orator of the Day, Citizens in Carriages. After marching through the principal streets to the excellent music of the band, the procession proceeded to the old cemetery across the river, where, with solemn ceremonies, the last resting place of the comrade and soldier whose life ceased that liberty might exist, was suitably decorated with floral tributes of affection in honor of their glorious memory. At the Catholic Cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery, and also at other places where reposed the heroic dead, the graves were similarly strewn with beautiful flowers, crosses, and bouquets. After returning from the cemetery to Central Hall, the exercises of the day were continued in the following order. Prayer by Rev. William T. Briggs, song Soldier's Requiem, Mixed Quartet, Poem, Mrs. Herbert Jones, music Norwich City Band, W.B. Balcom, leader, oration, A.F. Brown Esquire, song or the graves of loved ones plant beautiful flowers, music America by Norwich City Bland, <clears throat> benediction by Rev. Jonathan Neal. The oration of the day by A. F. Brown was an able effort in which the speaker forcibly portrayed the course for which our soldiers fought and died, and whose memory on this day had been honored by the beautiful floral tributes strewn o'er their graves. The oration was not long and tiresome, as is sometimes the case, but was pregnant with good sense, appropriative, and eloquent. <clears throat> the poem by Mrs. Jones was finely read and was befitting the occasion. The singing under the leadership of William Hunt was excellent in every respect. We have seldom had the pleasure of listening to finer music than that given by the Norwich City Band under its able leader. It was very favorably spoken of by all and gave complete satisfaction. At seven o'clock, a band concert was given in the open air to a large crowd. During the day, the ladies, always to the front in open air, or always in the front in good works, spared no pains or toil in preparing a collation. <clears throat> fit for the Epicurean gods, which was served in Banquet Hall to the G.A.R. Post and other participants in the ceremonies of the day. The exercises of the day concluded with a grand concert of war songs, commencing at 8 o'clock at Central Hall. The large hall was densely packed. The program, under the direction of William Hunt, consisting of war songs, duets, solos, quartets, bugle, drum, and fife calls, was admirably carried out and much enjoyed by the large audience, which testified its pleasure by frequent encores. <clears throat> H.F. Dudley's orchestra furnished instrumental music for the occasion. Mrs. Lizzie Calden presided at the piano. Thus concluded the ceremonies of the day, which were of more than the usual interest and drew many visitors from our neighboring towns. Samuel Sibley Post, G.A.R., with the aid of citizens and especially the ladies, has once more adorned the graves, 84 in number, of departed comrades and soldiers with beautiful flowers in token of sweet affection in which their honored memory is cherished. Once more the day set apart by the nation to commemorate the deeds of valor performed by noble heroes who sacrificed their life and who have since died of wounds and sickness contracted in that great struggle for human liberty has been fittingly observed. <clears throat> May 30th, 1907. The chief departure from tradition in Douglas's Memorial Day program was in having exercises at the cemetery at Douglas Center. This was where the services began. The band, which was imported from Danielson, Connecticut, detrained at Douglas Center instead of coming to East Douglas as in former years. 
Then it marched by the campground to the town cemetery, where Samuel Sibley Post, G.A.R., was awaiting it. At the cemetery, the memorial ritual for the Grand Army was read, and Reverend James Elvin offered prayer. A couple of girls recited pieces, and the band played. The band was then driven down to East Douglas, where a parade was started. Joseph Mills of Samuel Sibley Post, Marshal of the Day, and a drum major went ahead of the band. Behind the band were the veterans riding in a barge, Lambert B. Simmons Camp, S. of V., and half a dozen vehicles bearing such citizens as desired to be part of the program. The parade, forming at Fire King Hall, coursed down Main Street to the mill of W. E. Hayward and Company, where a flag was run up the staff on the tower, the band playing the Star Spangled Banner. The parade then proceeded to the Evergreen Cemetery. At the grave of James Wilson in this cemetery, Samuel Sibley Post repeated its memorial ritual. A countermarch brought the parade to the Second Congregational Church in East Douglas. The veterans went inside to attend the exercises while sons of veterans marched across the river to Village Pine Cemetery to have a memorial service and fire a salute. They couldn't do just as they had planned to do there, as the cemetery gate was locked and no one had the key to unlock it. The church was partly filled by an audience composed mainly of women and children. After some singing and reciting, Reverend James Elvin, pastor of the church, gave his address, Is Cotton King? This address was in part a reply to the book written shortly before the Civil War, Cotton is King. The author of this book contended, Mr. Elvin explained, that as cotton was the main article of commerce in America, and a product necessary to every man, woman, and child, the North would never enter, for the sake of ideals and principles, a war that would be destructive of the cotton region. Mr. Elvin paid the author a tribute of characterizing him as shrewd and hard-headed, but he had to deny that the book was a true prophecy. The Civil War, he maintained, was a triumph of righteous sentiments over this kind of Yankee-like calculation. There was music alone for diversion in the afternoon. The band stationed itself on the common at about two o'clock and played an hour or so. <clears throat> Celebrations. The Fourth of July. Independence Day. The birthday of our nation is the most jubilant of days, celebrated by demonstrations of young and old alike. July 4, 1876. Centennial. The celebration was a success. Everything passed off well, and out of the extensive program, everyone found some part which they could enjoy. On the evening of the 3rd, there was a general illumination of public and private buildings, torchlight procession, and a band concert. Many of the residences presented a splendid appearance, particularly that of Mr. Edwin Moore, which was handsomely decorated with lanterns and buntings and brilliantly illuminated. The torchlight procession in charge of W.H. Moore made quite a show. In addition to about a hundred torches, there were a number of transparencies, the work of W.A. Emerson and Otis Hunt, which created considerable merriment. One of them representing the various places of note in Douglas, another scenes in 1776 and 1876. At midnight, the Calathumpians appeared in full Thor force. The morning of the 4th was ushered in with a salute and the ringing of bells. At 8 o'clock, the trade procession and horribles, under command of William H. Moore, <clears throat> Chess J. Batchelor, and William A. Emerson, <clears throat> marshals formed at the junction of Main and Cemetery Streets in the following order. Chief Marshals, Douglas Brass Band, E. F. Darcy, Leader, W. E. Cook, Drum Major, Jean-Baptiste Society, Joseph Lehmann, President, Horribles, Antiques, etc., Austin Packard, Captain, Trade Procession, and Citizens in Carriages. The procession was the best that Douglas has seen on Independence Day for many years. Nearly all the traders were represented, and businesses, business of mechanics block was represented on one large wagon and made a good show. Williams and Hanson clotheries made the best appearance, in our opinion, of any. C.J. Bacheller, printer, had one of his presses in operation. W.S. Martin, Tinman, showed how it is done. Hugh Green, harness maker, represented his business well. W. A. Willis, mason, built quite a chimney in his wagon, and the butcher and fish dealers helped to swell the procession. <clears throat> the, horribles, the horribles were the best we ever saw in this town, and will not attempt to describe them. They want to be seen to be appreciated. After passing through the principal streets, the procession marched to the common, where there was a fireman's muster by the Douglas Fire Department. This was one of the best things in the morning's program. By the ingenuity of Henry Hutchins, a most comical affair had been rigged to represent an image, an engine, <clears throat> and the muster created an immense amount of fun. The Committee on Prizes, William Abbott, A.F. Jones, and Fenner Batchelor, 
then inspected the horribles and awarded the three prizes of five, three and two dollars, Larry Dermody taking the first, Douglas Fire Department the second, and Miller Hinton the third. The procession was then dismissed. At eleven o'clock, the exercises in the Congregational Church were as follows. Music. Choir. Prayer. Reverend William D. Bridge. Reading of the Declaration of Independence. William T. Briggs. Music. Band. Historical Address. A. F. Brown. Music. Choir. Oration. William H. Briggs. Music. Choir. <clears throat> Mr. Edwin Moore, as president of the day, officiated with his usual ease and dignity. Reverend Mr. Briggs read the Declaration of Independence, Independence in a clear and precise tone. Mr. Brown's historical address was an admirable production. It showed that much time and care had been given to its preparation. Without doubt, it is by far the most complete history of Douglas ever written, and it should be published and in the hands of every inhabitant of the town. When we learned that the committee had invited William H. Briggs to be the orator of the day, we anticipated an able address, and we were not disappointed. On the contrary, it was far in advance of what we had expected. Mr. Briggs held the closest attention of the large audience for about thirty minutes, and on retiring was loudly applauded. The music by the choir was good. At one o'clock a clam dinner was served in the orchard in the rear of Hayden's boot and shoe store. The band furnished music during the dinner. After the dinner, President Moore called the assembly together and announced that Mr. W. D. Jones, Toastmaster, would place another feast before them. Several sentiments were announced and responded to by D. A. Butler, Mr. A. F. Brown, Rev. W. W. Dow, Rev. W. D. White, Dr. White, Rev. W. T. Briggs, Mr. W. H. Briggs, and the President of the Day. After these exercises, there was a union prayer meeting at of one hour's duration at the Methodist Vestry, in conformity with the suggestion of President Grant. <clears throat> at five o'clock, there was a tub race on the William Hunt Pond, and at 6.30, a wheelbarrow sack, potato, and running races on the common, which created considerable merriment for a large crowd. In the evening, there was a fine exhibition of fireworks. The entire program passed off well, and it was the most orderly fourth that we ever remember seeing. We have yet to learn of a single row or disturbance of any kind. <clears throat> Parade of Horribles. Witty local hits made. East Douglas, Massachusetts, July 5th, 1907. Main Street was lined with people the morning of the 4th, the attraction being the Parade of Horribles, and many local hits were received with much humor. The parade started at 6.15 o'clock, headed by a drum corps and Emile Confret as marshal. The first was the Gentlemen's Driving Club, races today, Bingville Track. The trotters included Schuster's Gold Brick, Durham's Joda, Jody, Wickstead's New York Prize, Hayward's Knee Sprung, and Bert Aldrich's Beat All. Each had a jockey, and in the rig was a veterinary. The mottos were as follows. Protect your horse by uniformed police. Who has the best horse? The man with the most wind. If your horse goes lame, use You Can't Catch Labelle Oil or Durham's Easy Liniment to fatten use Jinx Cut Feed. For speed, use Libri's Speed Balls. And for colic, use Blue Jay's Spavin Cure. Douglas Center was represented by a large affair bearing the sign of Hotel Shorthorn and the following inscriptions. Some prefer this entrance. Phone me at 62. This is a no-licensed town. Vote for two constables. There was a driver handling six horses, a policeman in costume, and two stealthy Steves, clerk, etc. An automobile ice cart read, We want good roads for this ice cart. License number 23. This machine was made by the Douglas Auto Company. The Adams Express Company was represented by a hand cart labeled, Have Your Beer Come by Adams Express. A fire red automobile, license 16361. <clears throat> A rig contained several young folks representing coons who attracted attention by their dancing. It read, Look at the coons, everybody. My old Kentucky home. A hand organ turned by crank, the organman carrying a kitten, was among the number. Also a hand cart as a baby carriage. <clears throat> Turn the page here. After parading the principal streets, the judges, James W. Wickstead, George Abbott, Edwin P. Heath, John B. Chapdelaine, Walter Parker and Edward N. Jinks stationed themselves on the upper veranda of Hotel Durham to make their decision on the prizes. 
The participants at this critical time made their best showing. Several of the trotters were rubbed down, the auto tires were repaired, and two stealthy steves created quite a little excitement by making a raid on Hotel Shorthorn and securing 14 bottles which were deposited in their team, etc. Quite a little time was taken by the judges before James W. Wickstead announced the winners, which were as follows. First prize of $10 to Hotel Shorthorn of Douglas, which was received with much applause. The second prize of $6 was awarded to the Gentleman's Driving Club. The third prize of $3 was secured by the Schuster Automobile. The fourth of $2 to the Young Colored Folks. The fifth, Ice Cart Number 23, uh, $2. The sixth, Adams Express, uh, $1. Seventh. Hand organ, $1, and the eighth, the handcart baby carriage, $1. The winners received their money from Emil Rinfret. The young gentlemen from Douglas Center who captured the first prize were Charles Stevens, Frank Kopp, Charles Church, Leon Gilson, Walter Burns, Urban Peters, Paul Manning, Phil Gilson, Edward Buxton, Harry Dudley, Ralph Dudley, Patman Rawson, Raymond Dudley, Charles Hilton, Everett Sweet, Harry Peters, Otis Merrithew. A costumer was present from Boston in the interest of the Gentleman's Driving Club. <clears throat> Old Home Week East Douglas in gala attire. Great occasion for the little town. Nothing like it before in its history. The celebration began yesterday, and every train brought visitors, and the village was gay with decorations of flags and buntings. East Douglas, Massachusetts, July 28, 1903 the celebration of Old Home Week in East Douglas, Massachusetts, was auspiciously begun today at 6 a.m., when salutes were fired, bells rung, and whistles blown. The celebration will continue throughout the day and this evening. It is a celebration which far eclipses anything of the sort ever seen in the little New England town. Even the flexible memory of the venerable oldest inhabitant has not proved equal to the task of recalling the time of when a celebration of such magnitude was held in the village, and even the famous centennial celebration, which was for years considered to have been the acme of public festivities, has been forced to take second place. In this affair, the whole village has cooperated to make it a success, and that unity and concord, which are not always readily brought about among the inhabitants of a New England town, have reigned supreme in the village. So interested in the success of the festivities have the inhabitants become, that the thrifty housewives have even gone to the extreme of throwing open blinds of the cherished best room, and allowing the light of day to invade its sacred precincts, than which there can be no surer sign than that the celebration is of unusual importance. The village is gay with flags and buntings, even the humblest cottage displaying its flag or lantern, and on many of the well-kept lawns little flags seem to be growing from the ground. The decorations on many of the larger residences are elaborate, and in many cases decidedly artistic. The stars and stripes forms, of course, the principal element in most of the decorations. The red, white, and blue bunting, flags, and Japanese lanterns to complete the effect. In the evening, when the lanterns are aglow with lights, the picture was a most charming one. Some remarkably fine examples of colonial architecture are to be found in the town, as well as many houses of the type in vogue in the 1840s. The majority of the dwellings are painted in the characteristic New England style of pure white with green shutters. The dwellings are all built of wood, there being but three or four brick buildings in town. The decorations on some of the public buildings are decidedly handsome, those on the Congregational Church, Masonic Hall, and the East Douglas Hotel being especially good. The front of the church is draped with flags and bunting, the decorations extending well up to the belfry tower. In the center is a shield bearing the inscription, Welcome to our guests. The other buildings were tastefully decorated with flags, buntings, and lanterns. The spirit of the day was even entered into by Hong Li, the Chinese laundryman, and over his tiny shop the Stars and Stripes and the Harp and Shamrock of Ireland floated side by side. Yesterday, every train brought a large number of visitors, and from all the surrounding country the people came to town in carriages and wagons of various sorts and on foot, there being no electric car line in town. <clears throat> Among the visitors yesterday, there were many who were revisiting for the first time in many years the homes of their youths, and everywhere about the streets could be seen groups of people renewing the friendships of early days. Several distinguished, distinguished men who were either born in Douglas or have made it their homes for a greater or less time were among the guests. The principal events of the day centered in and about the Congregational Church on Main Street. On the common in front of the church, several tents had been pitched, and here the G.A.R. men made their headquarters and entertained visiting comrades. 
an arc, an arch decorated with red, white, and blue bunting bearing the inscription, Welcome Home, in raised letters of green, was erected on Main Street in front of the church common. The crowds began to gather early, and at ten o'clock the parade started, passing through the principal streets of the village. The German band of Webster headed the procession, followed by a company of about a dozen boys in colonial uniforms carrying wooden guns. Next in line came citizens and visitors, and the members of Sibley Post, G.A.R., and carriages bringing up the rear. An old cannon drawn by two horses attracted much attention along the line of march. The parade disbanded on the common, and the members of Sibley Post were drawn up in ranks, while the adjutant of the post, Charles H. Whipple, read the Roll of Honor containing the names of those comrades who have died since the organization of the command in 1882. This ceremony was a most impressive one, there being forty names on the Roll of Honor. When this was concluded, M. M. Luther, who commanded the post in the absence of Commander Jesse B. Sweet, made a brief address to the comrades and then assigned them to the tents. At twelve o'clock, mess call was sounded and the members of the post fell in to draw their rations, each being provided a tin plate, cup, and spoon. Each man presented his plate at the mess tent. He was given the typical army ration of pork and beans and a cup of coffee, which he took to the tent to eat. It required but little exercise of the imagination for those old veterans to once more see themselves beside the campfires of the Civil War. One of the most interesting events of the day was the reunion at the home of Mrs. Louise H. Pierce and the graduates of the class of 1879, Douglas High School. There were nine graduates, all living. The band played popular and patriotic music for an hour, and at two o'clock the exercises in the Congregational Church began. The program began by the playing of the Star Spangled Banner by the band, followed by a prayer by Rev. S. D. Coffin, after which Mr. Edwin Moore made a brief address of welcome and introduced Rev. Charles P. Pierce, pastor of the Congregational Church, who made the formal address of welcome. In his address, Mr. Pierce spoke of distinguished men, judges, teachers, and physicians, as well as successful businessmen whom Douglas had given the world, and he also mentioned the numerous evidences of progress to be found in the town. The band played Home Sweet Home with much feeling. As the first few bars of this beautiful song were played, a hush fell over the audience, and as the last strains died away, there were tears in the eyes of many, both men and women. The Civil War record in this little town, at that time of but a few over 2,000 people, 241 men, went to the front. General A.B.R. Sprague, ex-mayor of Worcester, and a distinguished officer in the Civil War, who was born in East Douglas, then delivered a very interesting address. General Sprague gave anecdotes to his early years in the town as it was 40 years ago, and contrasted the conditions then existing to those of today, and concluded with a brief sketch of his experiences in the Civil War. The day's program was brought to a close by an elaborate display of fireworks donated to the town by Harry T. Hayworth, Hayward of Franklin. The display was by far the largest ever seen in town, and some of the set pieces were very handsome. <clears throat> Labor Day. A week from Monday is Labor Day, September 2nd, 1907, and the people of Douglas will have the opportunity of enjoying themselves to the fullest extent, as well as lending aid to a worthy object, that of contributing to the Soldiers' Monument Fund. The Sons of Veterans will give a clam bake on the ball ground, and those in charge are working hard to make it a success. Dinner from noon till two o'clock. All day, refreshments of various kinds can be purchased at the different booths. A list of sports include greased pole climbing, running races, hammer throwing, weight pudding, potato race for ladies only, tug of war between teams from the Hayward and Schuster Mills and the Axe Works, greased pig, etc. In the afternoon, a ball game composed of those employed by the two mills will be played, and as the rivalry is great, excitement is sure to prevail. Ten dollars aside is the purse up, but all the proceeds will be given to the monument fund.